Hello, everybody. I would like first to thank Manus for the kind invitation and congratulate him for the nice Congress and the nice scientific program. Uh, I'll speak about partial rotator cuff ruptures, yes, but uh, only um, past the rotator cuff ruptures. First thing is to define what's the field, what we are going to speak about. And uh, we consider the partial uh, thickness tear uh, a definitive disruption, not just a fraying of the tendon. Uh, and uh, degree, the degree of uh, the lesion is mostly described in depth of the lesion and not in the uh, extension of the lesion according to the, to the tendon. And you can see various photos where you see uh, partial rupt uh, ruptural uh, tears. We n tend to classificate it at home uh, as helmets and we are going to speak only about articular side uh, rotator cuff uh, partial uh, tears. So one of the things that we must have in consideration is the natural history. Because if we thought that the small and tiny lesion will heal, perhaps we'll leave it like that. But uh, the natural history says that uh, spontaneous heal is extremely rare, not impossible, but extremely rare. And the facts that are contributing for that is, of course, aging, uh, the muscular contraction that uh, is uh, pulling the tendon, the hypovascularity that is in that environment, the inflammatory changes uh, together with the uh, oxidative stress, and this leads to augmented apoptosis and uh, the the degradation, progressive degradation of the quality of the tendon. Uh, one of the, the things that we know that uh, is definitely uh, interfering with tendon healing is, of course, smoking. The pathogenesis, you can see that in, your, in the video, you see a patient with uh, scapular dyskinesia. And uh, we have had two talks about the, imp the dyskinesia of the scapula and the adaptive movements of the shoulder. So, it be always begins either with a traumatic event or a non-traumatic event. And so we'll have either an intrinsic factors conjoined with extrinsic, extrinsic factors that will lead to an abnormal um, cyanetic movement of the shoulder and uh, uh, afterwards of the shoulder girl. And then uh, if we have a traumatic incident, of course, you'll have an impairment because of the structural lesion. But you, if you only have an imbalance of the shoulder, most likely you'll end up having um, um, a structural disease as has been shown, for instance, for the posterior superior impingement. The clinical presentation is very variable. And as uh, Ladislav said, it's, there's no correlation between the MRI findings or even the atroscopic <clears throat> findings somewhere and the clinical picture of the patient. This is due because most of the clinical picture of the patient is, is uh, based on the inflammatory response and of the quality of the long head of the biceps or stability of the long head of the biceps. There's why there are so, so much variabilities. In, for imaging, we can use, of course, uh, uh, echographic exam, as you can see, it, because it's dynamic and nowadays the new um, equipments are most likely to have the, the same specificity and uh, sensibility as MRI, but for the time being, uh, of course, the MRI is the, uh, with or without contrast, uh, is the gold standard for uh, the diagnosis. In some countries, like in uh, France, for instance, they uh, tend to use arthro CT scan, but uh, not in my, in my practice. We could also have a diagnosis during, uh, during um, surgery because we didn't do a diagnosis. We, do, we, were, we were not able to compensate the patient and we go to operate him, for instance, for an impingement syndrome to do a subacromial decompression. And we have the surprise, let's say, of a fraying of the tendon and we have to deal with it. That's another way to do the diagnosis. So now we arrive to treatment. Uh, the goal, of course, is to achieve the cure. And if we, by conservative measures, are able to alleviate the symptoms and to give uh, good function, there's no need for a surgery. Because if you, you get a balanced shoulder, you'll most likely won't have an aggravation of the structural damage. 
On the other, on the other hand, if you continue to have uh, imbalanced shoulder and uh, you continue to uh, not being able to uh, repair this in the, in the lesion, then you have an imbalanced shoulder. While we were talking, there was running, uh, there was running a, um, a video with a posterior superior impingement that I'm passing again. And just to see, for you to see the kissing lesion, but it, the, the, the idea that you want, I want you to, to have is that the treatment of this pasta lesion is not the treatment of the lesion uh, by itself. You should have to treat the micro instability of this patient in order to get rid of this problem for the patient. So we must be aware and correlate what we see with the history of the patient and the clinical exam of the patient and of course of the activity of the patient. So the critical decision for us is to, to know where, when, we, uh, and how to treat those patients. And if we are going to repair the patient because we don't have a balance of the patient, then we must decide if we treat it uh, in situ or if we debride it all and transform it in a complete rotator cuff rupture to, in order to, um, to treat this patient. I'm going now to try to answer those questions and to answer the questions what to do with the long head of the biceps that we know it's a serious problem. So to treat, I advise you to have uh, general principles. So mark any suspicion lesion on the articular side and then you go to the bursal side in order to see, for instance, as in this case, if you have also a rupture on this side or a fraying on this side, most likely this seemed like a partial rotator cuff rupture, but it is a, a complete rotator cuff rupture. So it is important for you to debride all the bursa in order to completely see the bursa and in order to be able to um, use multiple portals in order to see the, um, the rotator cuff. Also, it is important to assess the stability and quality of the long head of the biceps in order to take a decision. In this patient, you see the anterior pulley is not too good, the posterior pulley is gone, so most likely, as you have seen, there's inflammatory signs of the, of the long head of the biceps inside the groove, as you can see now, so you most likely have to take a decision about this long head of the biceps uh, after you repair this, ten this tendon, because if not, you'll squeeze it, you'll change its balance in inside the groove, and you need to do something. What should we do? We have two options. Either we do it uh, um, uh, uh, intraarticularly, uh, tenodesis, either we do it extraarticularly. Uh, we now are tending to do extraarticularly and extraarticularly with the screw, as you can see on the left side. And on the right side, you'll, do, you'll see an intraarticular uh, solution for the long head of the biceps. So we tend to take um, uh, some uh, action on the long half of the biceps and, and of course in the sports environment we tend to do it uh, with a screw and extra articular. Another uh, option will be to do it uh, sub uh, pectoral. We have done it before also, but as you know in the literature there's no really uh, difference, statistical significant difference between one and the other. So we tend to do it ex-articular and with an interference screw. When we have degenerative partial rupture, so we don't have a, tr a single traumatic incident to begin the, the complaints, we don't transform the rupture in a complete, uh, we transform, sorry, we transform the rupture in a complete one. Why? Because we think the rest of the tendon is not of good quality because this is a degenerative problem. We tend to do it and to, to solve it, uh, looking from intraarticular to, uh, and working from the subacromial, uh, subacromial space. Uh, we don't use metal anchors anymore, we use uh, peak anchors but it's, uh, it's, it's the same. And I call your attention for the images on the right because we use a single, uh, single needle in order to be very precise when we, where we put our sutures because I think the most uh, important problem uh, post-op for these patients is over-tightening of the, the rotator cuff, of tensioning of rotator cuff, and uh, most uh, of the cases of stiffness is on account of this. So we, we are very keen of not overstretching the, the, the rotator cuff in order to avoid 
uh, some stiffness. So the result will be like that when we do the stitch or we do the knots on the subacromial space that are going to be now. But we'll move on. In traumatic partial ruptures, let's say traumatic incident, complaints of the traumatic incident, no balance with the um, physiotherapy, they arrive to surgery. Normally they have that flap that you have sh sh seen there and there's a difference between the traumatic one and the non-traumatic one. The ones traumatic, they have a flap and this I tend to not complete the rupture because the, the, my tendon is of good quality. It was an incident, a traumatic incident, a single one that uh, broke my, my tendon so I'll tend to do the same. I use the same method, so we move on. But the things are not always like we like. And here we operated on a tiger. Uh, and to, just to explain to you, sometimes patients are not the way they should be for us to treat them. Very muscular and, uh, and sometimes not very compliant with the things that we do. And sometimes, of course, we, with our techniques, do it um, complicated a little bit and we have to solve those problems. So th those techniques that I showed to you are not uh, with, uh, without, without some problems. So for my take home message, uh, I'd say that treat pasta ruptures depending on the clinical and structural factors. If uh, you are dealing with surgery, uh, arthroscopy is the tool for pasta ones because you cannot do the diagnosis otherwise. Uh, then uh, I'll show, I showed you general principles how to, to deal with, uh, with the, the, um, the problem. What I do, I do repair in situ traumatic tears and I debride the rest of the tissue on degenerative and transform it to a complete rupture. And I uh, always take, uh, uh, always is a big word, uh, most likely take uh, an action on the long head of the bicep and I try to keep it simple. Thank you very much.